Now, it's sometimes asserted that museums, and in this lecture I'm going to talk mainly about art museums, are by nature educational institutions. But this is not necessarily true. Stewardship, that is uh, the preservation and uh, display of objects, can quite properly be undertaken without the intention of increasing knowledge or extending access beyond a select few. In the case of static and fragile collections, this might well be the right approach. Most museums are involved in creating and disseminating knowledge and are, to that extent, inescapably involved in education and access at some level. But many museums have taken uh, the view that they exist to create a tranquil environment in which those who wish to do so can appreciate and enjoy great works of art. <clears throat> in 1920, a delegation from the uh, organization representing museums in Britain warned the Ministry of Education that, and I quote, museums are not fundamentally educational institutions. And the Victoria and Albert Museum's Warders Handbook for 1952 reads with frankness, seldom encountered today, children are a difficult problem. <laughs> Any child may visit the museum if he or she behaves properly, but warders should call upon any child who will not behave to leave the museum, and if complaints from parents follow, warders will have the full support of the director. <laughs> In this lecture, I want to look back to the origins of the idea that the core purposes of a museum can include education and access. See how that idea has fared in practice and look at ways in which museums can tackle education and access now. I want also to challenge the idea that education and access are specifically late 20th century preoccupations and that instrumentalism, the belief that museums can legitimately be intended to contribute public goods beyond the preservation and display of their collections, is a novel heresy. When it was founded, the V&A was a new kind of museum, created not to house a collection, but to achieve a purpose, the improvement of design. As it neared the production of its report, the government decided, for the first time, to take an educational initiative. They would found a government school of design. <clears throat> Set up in what had been the fine rooms occupied by the Royal Academy of Arts in William Chambers' magnificent Somerset House, the new school faced an obvious problem. How was design to be taught? The solution lay from the beginning in the creation of a, te of a teaching collection, designated a museum. In January 1852, uh, this man, Henry Cole, was appointed to run the school as joint secretary with Richard Redgrave of a new Department of Practical Art, soon to become the Department of Science and Art under the Board of Trade, and already responsible for a network of 18 schools of art and design. By 1864, there were 90 spread across the country. The department ran a national art competition represented in this painting by Val Princev. Henry Cole is this figure here, and the uh, great painter Frederick Leighton is here. And this, this is the award of, of prizes from the best students in uh, the 90 art schools which had been created across Britain. Henry Cole, though, could see that the educational mission of the School of Design and its museum was not yet accomplished. He understood that there was no point in training excellent designers, and some of the school's early pupils, like Christopher Dresser, had proved to be designers of outstanding ability if there was no market for their designs. So Henry Cole, youthful companion of John Stuart Mill and a utilitarian through and through, 
conceived of a triply useful institution that would at once educate designers, inspire manufacturers, and reform the taste of the public at large, or as he put it, elevate the art education of the whole people, and not merely teach the artisans who are the servants of the manufacturers. Coherence, signally lacking at the beginning, was gradually re-established as the 19th century wore on. The original art museum gradually ejected the interlopers, some to the East End, others across the road to what became the Science Museum, and assumed the character which it has today. But that character is itself the product of divided intentions. Was the museum to continue as a resource for students and practitioners of art and design, and as an agent for sensitizing a wide public to the causes and consequences of visual choice? Or was it, as became fashionable in the late 19th and 20th centuries, to become a temple for the contemplation of great art? Henry Cole tended towards the former view, while John Charles Robinson, the V&A's first great curator, and many of his successors were drawn to the latter. Though both appreciated and to an extent supported the aims of the other. 